Hi, for this video, what we have is a consumer group claims that the mean annual coffee consumption in the US for one person is 23.2 gallons. A random sample of 70 people in the US has a mean annual coffee consumption of 21.6 gallons. And we want to assume the population standard deviation is 4.8 gallons. At 5% level of significance, can you reject the claim? So what we're going to do with this one is we are going to perform a hypothesis test. And to figure out the hypothesis test, the keywords that you want to look for is what population parameter you're studying. In this case, we're looking for our statement or our claim is about the mean. So that tells us that we're either going to run the T test or the Z test. The difference between the two is whether you know the population standard deviation or not. So since this one explicitly says the population standard deviation is 4.8, that tells us that sigma is known. We can say that sigma is 4.8. Since sigma is known, this points to using what is called the z-test for the mean. And that's because it's going to be based on the normal distribution rather than the t-distribution. So if you know the population standard deviation, you use the z-test for the mean. Otherwise, you use the t-test for the mean. So the other important things, remember that this is based on the central limit theorem, which means that you have to have enough information to be able to use it and check your all of your conditions with your text and everything because texts differ and professors and teachers differ as to what the expectation is. Um, the text that I'm currently using, the first thing in order to use the z-test is you have to know sigma. The second one that you have to have is a random sample which it does tell us that we have a random sample of 70 people. And then the last one is n has to be greater than or equal to 30, or it has to be normally distributed. And so since we have n equals 70, we have met this condition. So all of our conditions are met, so we can use the z-test. Um, some texts call it the z-test for the mean, but the name that you for sure have to have is the z-test. So since the conditions are met, what we want to do is we want to go back up and look at our claim. It tells us that the mean annual coffee consumption is 23.2. So since um, it's saying that the mean is 23.2, that's telling us that we have a statement of equality, which means that our claim is about the null hypothesis. So our claim is about the null hypothesis since we're saying that um, the mean is... 23.2. So the alternative is always the opposite. The alternative is the complement of this. So the opposite of equal to is not equal to. So we have a um, two-tailed test. The alternative hypothesis right here, this always determines the tail of the test. If the alternative is not equal to, this tells us that we have a two-tailed hypothesis test. So there's three types. You can either have a left, a right, or a two-tailed, and it always is determined by the alternative. If the alternative was less than, we would have a left tail. If it was greater than, we would have a right tail. But since it's not equal to, we have a two-tailed test. So in order to perform the hypothesis test, there are some sample statistics that we have to know. Um, one thing that I really quickly want to point out is you always use the population parameter here. So we always use mu in order um, to set up our null hypothesis. We don't ever test about the sample because the sample mean we already know. So it doesn't make sense to um, do a test for it. So we're testing for the population mean, which is why we used mu. So with this, let's write down our important information, the things that we have to know. Um, the sample statistic that we need to know is X bar. And for this particular case, it says that the random sample was 21.6. The other thing that we need to know, like, and we already wrote it down up here, is the population standard deviation. Remember, for the Z test, we need to know the population standard deviation. For the T test, we need to know the sample standard deviation. We also need to know the sample size. So in this case, 
we have sample size is 70, and then we need to know our alpha level. The alpha level is also known as the level of significance, and it's always written as a um, decimal. So since it says 5% level of significance, that's telling us that our alpha is 0 0.05. Our alpha helps us to determine, we compare it to our p-value, and the p-value is just the probability of getting this particular sample for this sampling distribution, which is why the central limit theorem has to kick in and you have to have a large enough sample size. So with this, we always want to draw a picture of our information, and because we're using a normal distribution, we would just draw the normal model out. And this would represent our model for this. And then there's variance on whether how you want to draw this, um, depending upon which method you use, whether you use a p-value or a rejection region, your picture will look slightly different. Um, for this one, I'm going to use a p-value. Um, and you have the choice if you can either center it with the 23.2 and your x-bar and shade it in, or you can wait and find your samples, um, your your standard test statistic first. So um, our test statistic is, sorry, the test statistic, my brain just did not want to. So the test statistic, in order to find it, we would use the formula Z equals X bar minus mu divided by sigma over the square root of n. And you need to remember that when you are plugging this into your calculator, that you do have to put both the numerator and the denominator in parentheses, or else you will make a mistake. If you want to put it in all at once, make sure that you add the parentheses. So one option is to use the 23.2 and the 21.6 to label, or we can find our test statistic first, and we can start at zero, and then we can kind of see, because remember that it goes out one, two, three in each direction. Um, so based on the test statistic, it gives us a more accurate representation of where we should put our value. So let's go ahead and find that. All we have to do is plug our information into our formula. So x bar is 21.6. Mu is always based on your null and alternative. So that's the 23.2. And then we would plug in the 4.8 divided by the square root of 70. And like I said, make sure that you always include this part in parentheses when you plug it into your calculator. And when you do that, you get approximately negative 2.789. I did round this. So negative 2.789 is just going to be a little bit of area. It's almost three standard deviations out, so it's only going to be a little bit. So this is our test statistic, the negative 2.789. Um, so then what we would do is we would find our p-value. The p-value is simply the probability that um, of getting this sample if this were truly the mean. So if this were the mean with this standard deviation, how likely is it to get a sample like this? So the p-value is something that you have already found in a statistics class. It's just the probability of getting this sample. So what we can do is we're looking for what is the probability of getting a z-value that is less than 2.7. And I'm going to go ahead and round it to 9 because I'm going to use the table to help us find that. So once you've calculated your standardized test statistic, you would then go to your table and we would look for negative 2.79, which is right here, the 0 0.0026. And then we would write that down, the 0 0.0026. Since this is a two-tail, I need to go back up and fix my picture since it's a two-tail. Um, it can be an either tail since it was not equal to. It can either be down here or up here. Um, so because of the fact that it's a two-tail test, we have to do two times the area. So it's two times the probability of being less than that. So we would do two times 0 0.0026. And we would end up with 0 0.0052. So anytime you have a two-tail test, you must shade both tails and you must do two times the area underneath your z-score to get your p-value. 
And then our decision is based on our p-value. So we would take our p-value and we would compare it to our alpha. So since the p-value of 0 0.0052 is less than alpha equals 0 0.05, we always reject h sub 0. So that's how we make our determination. If it's greater than alpha equals 0 0.05, we fail to reject because that means that the evidence is not strong enough for the alternative. Um, so since it's less than 0 0.005, we reject H sub 0. And because our claim was about the null hypothesis, um, when we write our interpretation of this, because it's always important to write the interpretation, um, we always start with our alpha level or our significance level. So at um, 5%, because remember our significance level, our alpha was, and you can either put alpha equals 0 0.05 or you can say at 5%. Um, we are rejecting, since we rejected H sub 0, we are rejecting our claim. We can say that we have enough evidence to reject the claim. And here is where you would just go back and revisit what your claim was so that you have the context of your original problem. So since the consumer group complains that the mean annual coffee consumption in the U.S. for one person is 23.2 23 gallons, we can say that we have enough evidence to reject the claim that the mean coffee consumption um, per person in the U.S. is 23.2 gallons. So we have enough evidence to reject this. And you could even go so far as to say, based on this sample, it appears that the co coffee consumption is less than the 23.6 or the 23.2 because the 21.6 was below that. Um, so remember that if you are doing a Z test for the mean, you must know the population standard deviation in order to run this. And I would say out of the two hypothesis tests for the mean, this is the less likely used, just because most of the time we don't know the population standard deviation. And you have to have enough information for the central limit theorem to kick in in order to use it. And then if you are using a p-value, you would compare your p-value to your significance level to make your determination. As always, thanks for watching. Please continue to check out all of my video content.